Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of Meet Members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. Live from St. Paul, Minnesota, we welcome you to another season of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers who are prepared to answer your questions and discuss important issues affecting citizens of Minnesota. Here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to Your Legislators. For over 30 years, this program has been coming into your living room and we've been bringing the legislators who represent the people of the state of Minnesota to those living rooms to talk about the issues of the day. We're delighted that you are with us for yet another season and we have a distinguished all-star lineup uh, tonight to, to talk about what the legislature may be facing in the next uh, few months. When we were last with you in May, we had finished the end of a very long and difficult winter, and we were looking forward to a week or two of spring and then maybe summer, and here we are back in winter again. But, but we're going to have a great conversation today, and we want you to be a part of it. So we invite you to call in your questions or to send them to us via facsimile uh, or, uh, excuse me, by email, and then they'll send, <laughs> they'll send them to us by facsimile, and we'll, uh, we'll give them to our panel to have them... Uh, you know, chew over the important issues of the day. We begin this program tonight as we do each week by introducing our distinguished panel of guests. To my immediate left, from Crosby, District 10B, Representative Joe Rodinovich. Did I pronounce that right? You got it right. So that's a, you know, blind squirrels find nuts once in a while. Anyway, <laughs> tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I represent District 10B in the legislature. Uh, that's uh, Aiken County and uh, Crowen County. I'm from Crosby, Arlington, Minnesota. I'm a fourth generation resident of the area, and I'm in my first term serve on uh, primarily education-related committees, K-12 education finance and uh, early childhood youth development, as well as the housing committee, and then uh, I've done some work on the living wage jobs committee that uh, is chaired by Representative Winkler. So I'm eager to be here tonight, and uh, this is my second trip to the show. So. From District 21, Red Wing, Senator Matt Schmidt. Senator Schmidt, we were talking a little bit before we started. Turns out you've got a connection to Crosby, Ironton, don't you? That's right. My uh, my mother is from uh, Ironton, and my grandparents are still with us. So I make a, a trip up there uh, as often as I can. So I think I spent more holidays than not in Crosby, Ironton. Are you satisfied with the the representative for your uh, for your relatives? Or <laughs> you know, I, I know he's working hard because every time I visit, I run into him at a coffee shop meeting with uh, his constituents. So. Uh, oh. Well, this is a good thing. Well, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and, and well, what's going on in Red Wing. I'm a lifelong resident of, of Red Wing. Just love uh, southeastern Minnesota, our trout streams and our bluffs and the river and the, the egg land down there. Uh, real, real pleased to be able to serve on, I think, appropriate committees in the legislature with the Agriculture, Rural Development and Jobs Committee and also the Energy and Environment Committee uh, and the uh, State Capital Investment Committee. And uh, I've had a chance to dig in in all those areas, and, uh, and I think we're doing good work. Well, very good. Joining us uh, this evening is Senator Michelle Benson from Ham Lake, Minnesota. We were just discussing this. Uh, you're originally from Murdoch, which I is also did. a very important part of our viewing area. Tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, I did grow up in Murdoch, but uh, my husband and I have lived in Anoka County, I think we're in 19 years now. I uh, represent the northern part of Anoka County, a little bit of Sherburne and Isanti counties. I serve on both Senate Human Services Committee, Energy Committee, the um, Office of the Legislative Auditors Commission and the Minsure Oversight Committee, which has taken up a disproportionate <laughs> part of my time. There, there has been some interest in that topic, <laughs> I guess. I mean, perhaps we'll talk about that this evening, as a matter of fact. So tell our viewers a little bit. Uh, we're going to be talking about the legislature and, and the is legislative issues more than anything else. But you do have another little project that you're involved in. And maybe, uh, yes. maybe you could touch on that so our viewers know about it. And Senator Dave Thompson has asked me to join his team as lieutenant governor candidate. And, of course, Senator Thompson is running for governor, and, uh, yes. and uh, as are a number of other candidates. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll probably have an opportunity to visit about that as well as the weeks go, uh, go by here. And finally, also joining us from District 35A from Anoka, Representative Jim Abler. Representative Abler, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you. It's uh, great to be here. It's, I can't believe it's been 16 years already. Who would have thought? Mm -hmm. um, it goes by, and I've been active in the health care arena. I'm a chiropractor 35 years. And that's gone by rapidly. We have uh, six kids, three grandkids, two on the way. And that's amazing. And, you know, it, it's, um, 
healthcare is such an important area. It touches so many lives and in so many ways. And I thought I would go broader in my legislative work, and instead I've gone narrower and deeper, and that's been remarkable. You, too, uh, have, uh, have a little uh, hobby that you've, engaged, you've, you've undertaken or an occupation. I'm not sure what you call it when you're running for another <laughs> office, but, uh, but certainly it's a lot of work and a lot of time spent, just as uh, Senator uh, Benson is experiencing. Tell our viewers a little bit about, uh, about your effort. Well, sure. I'm running for the U.S. Senate, uh, and it's uh, an amazing run that's been. We've uh, got to go. I've been to 245 places across the state. And it's an amazing state between Crosby and Murdoch and the rest of the world. We're an amazing people, and I'm uh, eager to represent them uh, as a U.S. Senator. All right. Well, we're going to talk tonight, though, about what's going on in the Minnesota Senate and the Minnesota House and, and uh, what issues are of concern to the people of the state of Minnesota. Again, I encourage our viewers to call in your questions. Uh, send them to us via email, and we'll see that they get to the panel. And so before we get some of those questions, let's, let's maybe go around the table and have you identify uh, for our viewers the issues that you think are most important in these next few, uh, few weeks. And let's start. I think you're a veteran legislator here, I would suspect, right? You know, I'm the old guy all of a sudden. How did that happen? <laughs> I still feel young. Well, um, if, if it's any consolation, I think of myself as the junior member of the court, and sure, now, sure. now Alan Page is the senior member, and I'm next to him in seniority. So the Amazing. time the time goes by quite it, it, quite 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 quickly. Anyway, tell our viewers a little bit about what you think might be coming up. Well, certainly health care, and the senator mentioned that already. It's you know it's it's going to be an issue, and we're going to talk a lot about even how well it, the whole Obamacare Affordable Care Act was it affordable. You know, is any care involved? Is it working? Is it worth $180 million we've got tied up in the website? And, you know, are some people still on hold? Uh, will Mary get her insurance in time? <laughs> Tune in on Tuesday to see. So that'll be quite a topic. Um, there'll be some budget uh, surplus that people get to discuss. Uh, we'll be, we may discuss where the surplus came from, if it's really a surplus or if it should stay in people's pockets. So we'll talk about uh, disability services. There's a uh, the PCAs would like to get a 5% raise so they can afford to continue to serve some very uh, sensitive uh, families. Those are certainly going to be some of the big topics coming up. Senator Benson? And I think given that we are projecting a surplus we did in November and will likely in February see another surplus, repeal of some of the taxes that were put into place, some that are particularly harmful to our business economy, I think those need to be on the table for repeal. Uh, federal conformity. Minnesota's uh, tax code is unnecessarily complicated uh, when compared to the states around us. So I think we need to look at some of those things. We have a surplus. Let's get it back to the people who earned it. Senator Schmidt? Well, in 2013, we spent a lot of time balancing our budget. And for the first time in a decade, we have a, a balanced budget, no shifts, gimmicks, or games. That's no minor accomplishment. I think next, we, uh, we need to focus on infrastructure and making sure that we're making uh, quality investments in roads and bridges, sewer and water, and also a very important piece of infrastructure that I, I think that we need to talk more about in St. Paul, and that's broadband connectivity. And that's whether it's wireless or, or fiber connections to, uh, to many homes and businesses throughout greater Minnesota. It's an issue I'm very uh, passionate about. Uh, spent uh, a good part of uh, the interim here the last several weeks and months getting around the state, talking to folks, uh, uh, over 20 communities visited. And we, in my mind, uh, that's something that we need to focus on this session. It fits really well into the, the frame of, uh, of infrastructure investments with the bonding bill and also with the governor's call for a non-session. We, uh, folks, we have more references to the telegraph than to the Internet in state law right now. And I just think that's unacceptable in 2014. So I think we've got to make our state law more, uh, well, it's going to be smarter and, and more apt for the time. Tele telegraph service is not a major issue for this session. <laughs> well, that, uh, it's, it's right there with the facsimile. So I, you know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's, I, I, I knew somebody was going to say something about it. I'm revealing my age. I remember when it came in, and this was a major innovation. So uh, mm -hmm. that, that's my problem, not yours. Anything else, Senator Schmidt? Well, you know, I think we're, we're uh, identifying a number of issues uh, right here. Uh, I know there's going to be a good discussion of the minimum wage. Uh, I think and so agree it's, it's time for an increase and in, in what that number is, what's an appropriate number. That's something we'll be talking a lot about. And I, I'd like to have a conversation about transportation finance, too. I think uh, that's an area uh, that, that uh, well, the, 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 uh, the unmet need is, is only growing, and we've got to figure out a way to, to, to catch up with that backlog of, of, of needed projects. Representative Radinovich, your thoughts? Yeah, um, well, uh, being the fourth person to talk yeah. here, uh, a lot of the, <laughs> the, the prime topics have sort of uh, picked over, but I think the most important issues for me, of course, are the ones that are local. Uh, so there are several local projects that I'm working on in the Crosby, Arrington, and Aiken areas. Um, uh, things where uh, wastewater infrastructure and, um, you know, the, the type of things that uh, we, we could see in a bonding bill, investment in uh, airports, uh, in uh, the college in uh, Brainerd there, Central Lakes sure. College. So. 
Um, I think that those are some of the things, of course, uh, the big ticket things that we're looking at this year are the minimum wage. And uh, there are a lot of Minnesotans out there that will be impacted by an increase in the minimum wage. The House passed an increase of 950 uh, that, in fact, uh, that would uh, benefit over 200,000 Minnesotans if we raised the wage at that point. These are people who have lost uh, wages to inflation that um, we know that if the wage would have kept pace with where it was in the 1960s, that it would be at over $10 an hour right now. And so. Um, as we look at Minnesota's economy, I think we have to ask, is it working for everyone? And uh, Representative Abler had, of course, mentioned people who are doing home health care work right now. I met with a group of those workers the other day, and um, they're making about $9.25 an hour. They haven't seen an increase in a few years, and uh, they received no sick or uh, vacation days. And so uh, one of the people I talked to had had a reconstructive knee surgery early in the week and had to go back to work by the end of the week. And so um, I think we have to ask ourselves some very critical questions about how Minnesota's economy is working for uh, those in the bottom quartiles. We're going to come back to the minimum wage because I'm sure our viewers will have questions about that and it's something we're going to need to talk about. But of course, in the so-called off-year or short session or whatever you refer to it, one of the principal topics is always the bond, the bonding bill. And I'd like to get some sense from our panel today what you think the size of that bill might be, what kinds of projects are likely to be included, maybe projects you think should be included, or maybe projects you think shouldn't be included. I guess we could cover that, too. And maybe we'll start with the senator from the majority party, uh, uh, Senator Schmidt. Uh, and we'll go around the table this way. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your view of the bonding projects and where you think this might go in this short session. You know, I've had the opportunity to serve on the, the, the uh, Capital Investment Committee, made my way around the state for that tour as well, and uh, saw a lot of great ideas out there, a lot of good projects. I think we have almost $3 billion of projects identified in this state. And in my mind, the bonding bill is a great platform for, you know, a, a partnership between the state and, and, and local units of government or other, uh, other partners. And, and we really have to focus, I think, on projects of regional significance, those that, uh, that uh, invest in, in basic infrastructure, uh, and particularly those that have a, a promise of economic development return. And, and so I, I think that that's going to be our focus this, this coming session. I know the governor's put forth his ideas in a bonding bill. One thing that I would challenge my colleagues to, to, to think seriously about is, given the fact that uh, we have a, a backlog of, of great projects out there, interest rates remain relatively low, unemployment still a challenge in many parts of the state, we've got to get past that, that psychological burden of $1 billion in a bonding bill. And I think at some stage in the game, we've got to realize that you know, the need is out there, uh, and, and we've got to be able to, to, to take those tough votes and, and put a package together that exceeds that limit. I think uh, anything under about $1.3 billion this year would be uh, responsible under our state uh, uh, capital investment guidelines for borrowing. And I think that, that I would challenge my, my colleagues to, to, to get past that psychological burden and, 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 and look at a, a, a bigger bill that, that would really put more Minnesotans together or to work at, at this time and also invest in really neat, you know, good projects in all corners of the state. Senator Benson, your thoughts? Um, there was a global agreement last year that the bonding bill would be just over $800 million, and I think if it focuses on projects of regional significance, I'm particularly a fan of roads and bridges. We could focus a little more on that and a little less on, you know, special projects um, that the governor has inserted in his bill. I think we would have much better luck getting bipartisan support on a bill that kept under the, uh, the billion-dollar mark for the biennium regional significance, roads and bridges, I think you'd get a lot of support, and Minnesotans would be grateful. Just so that our viewers are clear on this, as I understand the process, uh, bonding is a little different than other legislation in that it requires a 60 percent vote. Am I, am I recalling correct. this correctly? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it is one of those issues where there's going to there, there will of necessity be some across-the-table communication and, com and uh, conversation about that topic. Representative Abler? Well, it's, um, let me just back up a little bit about that cross-the-table discussion that we need to have. Um, either side, when it has the majority in either body, tends to enjoy that position it has, and, and it's a winner-take-all sometimes. I've seen that in my now 16th year. And good laws don't happen from winner-take-all. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, was all one side. And people on the other side had firm convictions about it, and some of the tax bills and so on were one side. And some of us in our time have tried to find ways to bridge gaps and work together, and, and it's a real effort to do that. On the bonding bill, I think it's important for the majority party to recognize that some people in the minority really have strong feelings about some of the quality of projects that go in and the size, and they're interested in helping Minnesota thrive. But at the end, they just don't believe it to be true. And this is the one place in a divided legislature, or no, in an all-one-side legislature, that the minority party has a say. And I hope as the process unfolds that people recognize that. 
And last time that wasn't recognized and a bill failed in the House uh, unnecessarily that uh, was not agreed to. And so people, as I've traveled the state just in general, people want us to work together and get things done and figure it out and keep it off their back and make it solid. And, and the best work we've done ever in my 16 years has been when both sides have said, let's go solve this problem. Let's never mind who gets the credit. And this bonding bill, as it goes forward, as uh, summarizing the two senators' points of view, we can get a really good bill put together if we recognize the wisdom that the legislature has and there's a collaborative spirit. That would be a nice thing. Do you have some thoughts about specific projects that, uh, that you think should be included or not included? Or Yeah. It's, I think it's important to really have the term regional or statewide significant. I've seen a lot of interesting projects show up in, in bills that are of city-wide interest to somebody's city. Uh, mm -hmm. um, there is a, Highway 10 is a real problem for our area between Anoka and St. Cloud, and there's a, a need for a bridge in the city of Ramsey, which is my district. Um, but that happens to, uh, it's, it's a city need, but it's a whole corridor that's just so congested. Try to go, well, try to go to Aiken. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on Friday night. And you'll, yeah. Tonight if you're trying to avoid 94, that's one way to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's something we're trying to, because it actually, uh, just uniquely, my city, uh, Ramsey, has four main thoroughfares all bisected by a train track. Mm. It has no uninterrupted. If a train comes by, the fire truck can't get there to oh, put sure. out the fire or the ambulance. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so everybody, this is you know, arguably regionally significant and it seems popular. And everybody wants to serve their district and look after the wastewater and all that. So, but I, I hope that respect can rule as we go through this process on this topic. And that's what people want us to do. Mm -hmm. Representative Dinovich? Yeah. Um, well, Representative Abler uh, talked, you know, I, I think very wisely about um, bipartisan support for projects and uh, projects of regional significance. And in our area right now, uh, Representative Ward and uh, Senator Rood, who's, you know, our partner in the Senate, uh, we're from different parties. Uh, Representative Ward and I are Democrats. Mm -hmm. Senator Rood's a Republican. But um, we just sent a letter to the governor a couple weeks ago encouraging him to take another look at uh, the Brainerd Airport. I mean, that is certainly a project of regional significance. Uh, they've got a, a, a problem with the wastewater infrastructure, or excuse me, the, uh, the water infrastructure out there right now. The fire marshal said that it's not um, sufficient to support uh, an emergency situation. Um, the Chamber of Commerce and the Economic Development Corporation up there have come together uh, with the support of the legislate, uh, legislators from that area. Uh, and what we'd like to see is, um, you know, uh, sewer water, uh, sewer and water brought from the city of Brainerd out along the 210 corridor there because, and the reason those, all those partners have come together is it's not just important for the airport, but it's important for the environment uh, around there. There's a lake uh, that has a sensitive ecosystem and we want to make sure that we can take those, um, you know, aging septic systems off that as well as um, provide uh, opportunities for businesses to expand along the 210 corridor towards Crosby. And so I, I think that that project, you know, fits the bill and that's something that we're working on uh, as a bipartisan team to, to make sure that we can and try and get that funded in the bill. Other thoughts on bonding before we move on? If not, we'll move on to... Well, just a thought in general. And I, I think it's important for people from one part of the state to recognize that this state is an important part of the state. And mm -hmm. uh, on, the, on the worst parochial days, what's my backyard, what's my little district look like? Um, but it's important to keep outstate Minnesota, greater Minnesota, mm -hmm. open. Mm -hmm. And um, some people from the metro don't get that. I've been exposed on so many times in the last six months, like, wow, I didn't know you even needed that out here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's been very productive. I think if everybody could get around the state, it would be better. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about uh, in, uh, the issue that you mentioned, and maybe we'll start with you, Representative Radinovich, which is the minimum wage. And uh, of course, that was a very controversial topic last session, mm -hmm. didn't happen, going to be on the table uh, this session. Uh, maybe you can tell our viewers a little bit how you view the topic and where you think that figure might land in terms of what you'd like to see, and we'll kind of go around the table here and have some conversation about this. Yeah, um, so I, I voted for the minimum wage coming out of the House at 950 last year. Uh, the, senator, the senators here uh, know that their bill was 775, and you know they'll have an opportunity to speak to that, but I think that we need to have a number closer to 950. Uh, if you look at the minimum wage, as I had mentioned earlier, tied to inflation uh, from the 1960s, it would be at about $10.75 an hour right now. And uh, if you if furthermore tied it to productivity at that same point in time, uh, it would be in excess of $15. And so what we're seeing is that the American worker is much more productive than they have been before, but the wages have remained stagnant. And I think that we can feel that in our towns and cities. Uh, 60 to 70 percent of the, the students in my district are on free or reduced lunch, and it speaks to the economic condition of their, their parents. And we understand the effects of poverty uh, on the outcomes of uh, children in school. 
I um, personally also, you know, think that if you look at working full time at uh, the minimum wage right now, you'd make about fifteen thousand dollars a year, and so we're subsidizing companies who pay wages that aren't sufficient to support, uh, you know, their workers on uh, by providing assistance to them. And I think some of my friends on the other side of the aisle might say something about raising taxes and the disincentive that provides for hard work. And I would sort of pose the question, well, you know, if you could work 20 hours a week or, or 60 hours a week and you're still, you know, one car bill away from being wiped out or, you know, one, one medical bill away from being wiped out, or if you, you know, uh, work 20 or 60 hours a week and you still can't, um, you know, provide the basic things for your family, then, um, you know, where is your incentive for hard work? And so I think that we ought to make sure that we can connect the, work, the idea that uh, full-time work uh, should mean that you can support yourself and your family. Uh, I understand that, you know, even at 950, uh, it's going to be difficult to do that. But if we don't start to have that conversation, if we don't start to try and rectify the situation that we've seen over the last 30 years, uh, we're going to have a growing disparity uh, between uh, people in Minnesota, and we're going to have more children who are, you know, uh, receiving services and uh, being affected by that. You know, a lot of attention has been directed on uh, and towards the issue of income inequality in, 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 in Minnesota, in the United States, and there's only so much that we can do as policymakers to address that. I mean, we can look at the safety net for helping folks out who are struggling, but more and more you're seeing hardworking families in Minnesotans uh, struggle to get by despite working full, full uh, work weeks. I just had an opportunity to, to meet with uh, Second Harvest Heartland today, and they shared some uh, interesting information about uh, folks who are utilizing, you know, food shelves in my district. In, in the growest, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the strongest growing segment of my, you know, uh, district that's uh, tapping into to food shelves are working families, working adults. And I think it just speaks to the, the struggle that a lot of Minnesotans are facing right now. And so, you know, I believe in a, a strong safety net that's appropriate, that's accountable. But I also believe that this is one of those votes with the minimum wage where we, where we can take a stand and say, you know, working Minnesotans need to be able to, to, to make it in this state. And uh, darn it, our, our minimum wage is below the federal minimum wage. And there's discussion at the federal level of raising its wage. And so I, I'm very optimistic that the Senate and the House are going to be able to, to strike a compromise. I, I certainly believe that the the, that the House position is, uh, is more in line with where our, our minimum wage should be in Minnesota. Uh, we have to be respectful of, of challenges faced by border communities and others. But on the flip side, I think this is a, a chance for us to say there's a problem out there with income inequality, and this is something that we can do. Uh, I, I want to listen to businesses. I want to listen to employers. But at the end of the day, this is one of those, those opportunities for us to say there's a, a wrong and, uh, and an ill in, in, in uh, public life, and we, we can do something about it. Um. It's interesting, only 5% of people who earn minimum wage are head of household. And so what if we took the, those 5% and used the, the job training programs that we have at the federal level and the state level and said, instead of just giving you a little bump so that you continue to live on the edge, let's make sure that you get trained for critical jobs that we need. For example, in greater Minnesota, we are terribly short welders and metal workers. Um, our healthcare industry is facing a crisis. We don't have enough people going into basic care services. And so what if instead of taking away the opportunity for teenagers to get that first job where they clear tables and they learn how to get there on time and punch in on time, instead of making those jobs more expensive, why don't we focus on the people who really have a need? And then the other question that I never hear answered, lifeguards at the YMCA, 16-year-old lifeguard starts at $9.25 an hour. If we raise the minimum wage to $9.50 an hour, those lifeguards are going to get a bump. Where's the YMCA going to get that money? They're either going to have to reduce programs, they're going to have to raise fees for people coming in the door. No one ever talks about where the money comes from. So while we can all have compassion for families that are struggling, and that is appropriate, we should focus on getting them the education they need so that that mom and dad can really take care of their family and can launch themselves and set an example for those kids that says, you can do this. You can go to college, you can achieve, and you can take care of yourself, stand on your own two feet. And I think you would get a lot of Republican support for going to federal conformity. Um, I think that puts us on a level playing field. Federal conformity would mean you'd mean the, the level of the, the right. federal minimum right. wage. A lot of our large employers are already there. Um, there's some discomfort among small businesses in the resorts community at moving too high too fast because they have fixed costs and there's only so much they can charge their customers. And so the question is where does the money come from 
to pay for the increase. It's good to be compassionate and it's important. I'm, we're on human services committees. We see what people go through. But we have to find a way to actually help them out instead of just giving them a little more and leaving them on the edge. Representative Abler, and then we'll throw it open here and see what oh, people sure. have to say about this. Well, I think it's important for people to recognize that one side doesn't love people more than somebody else and that, that it's a matter of who cares more. Um, I'm a small businessman. I own some commercial property. I rent to 24 small businesses. And they're barely making their rent. And, and so is the issue about evil corporate America or small business that's not paying enough? The money has to come from somewhere. And so the extra $2 or 25 cents or whatever the change is comes from somebody's budget. If it comes from a small business budget, then that small business, it, it actually may affect their ability to pay their rent and stay in business. I met a fellow up in Hackensack, a place called Diddles and Joe, and he, his people get um, $12, $15 an hour up there, but their base wage is, I don't know, six fifteen or the 7 or whatever. But he said if he had to go to the number that's suggested, he hasn't got the money. And he said he would close. And I don't think he was kidding. He's got a dozen employees, and because there's no margin, he can't raise his hamburgers a dollar or two dollars to raise the money from. And so, um, if the issue is you want to help, there's different categories of people earning minimum wage. Some of them are students getting a training wage, and so they have this job that they don't want to stay in very long, and then they move to another job that's better. They get a resume and they get worked up. Uh, some of the teens, in particular, um, you have to be careful how you take away these low paid opportunities for them to keep busy and have something to do in the summer. Six boys, please get a job doing anything. My wife used to say, exactly. little job, little job. Anything. But just for instance, the, the market pressures push uh, in today's paper. The gap is now going to make $10 as minimum wage without a law. At my clinic, nobody will work for less than $10 an hour. And so I just want to caution people as we go into this well-intended thing that every good thing may have an unintended consequence. The Congressional Budget, Budget Office said a million jobs will be lost. And if those are the million jobs from some of the kids and the training wage and those, those young teens, and they wind up not having a job and now they have to hang around all summer and get in trouble, that might be a price we don't want to pay. So you have to be cautious. That's my thought. Yeah. I, um, you know, this is something that I've spent a lot of time talking about just today because I happen to have done some interviews and everything else. But, um, you know, I, I don't just I, I don't doubt for one second, Representative Babler, that you care very much about uh, the people you represent and everyone you meet. You're, you know, well known as being a, a great guy. Um, but I, I think that policies do matter. And this is about macro trends in the economy. And what we've seen are a separation between wages and productivity. And that's, you know, been detrimental to the people of the state. I mean, there's no question about it. And what I would say is that there are always going to be people at the bottom of the economic scale. And the question is, how do we value their time? How do we value their labor? Um, you know, we can give them job training, but someone else is going to come fill that job that they left them. And so we still have to consider them. I would also like to mention that, um, you know, uh, Senator Benson, you had talked about the lifeguards. So I just did some quick math, and if uh, they had two lifeguards on a day, and they paid them a dollar an hour more at 10.25 an hour over the course of a week, uh, I believe they would pay uh, an additional $112. And I, I think that the YMCA is capable of finding $112 a week. Uh, whether they have to raise over the course of a year uh, membership dues a dollar per member or whatever it is. But I mean, the argument is that um, low, low prices should be predicated on the low wages that we pay people. I don't, I can't accept that, you know. I mean, if you look at a, a grocery store and what's happened, and this is an example of productivity. So 20 years ago, you used to have somebody who would bag your groceries and check you out. And now, uh, you know, if you look at you got a, a bay with four self-checkouts and one person standing in the middle. And so why isn't that person experiencing any of the growth in productivity? They're still getting paid essentially the stagnant wages. And that's the issue for me. And just this, uh, I think, last week, 70 leading U.S. economists, including seven Nobel laureates, came out and said that uh, there's, you know, the weight of the evidence suggests that there's a negligible impact on jobs and that there is a stimulus effect in local economies from paying those people more. So while your, your, the gentleman up in Hackensack might have to pay his workers more, it means that they can spend more money in the town, too. They might be able to go out and enjoy a hamburger every once in a while, too. So I think it's absolutely essential that we raise the minimum wage, and I think it should be 950 uh, and, and not a cent less personally, but uh, we'll see what we can work and, out with the Senate. And frankly, my Y on Sundays has eight lifeguards on. And for swimming lessons, there's more than that. And so the, it, your math might work, 
But the question is, who gets to make that choice? Who should the legislature dictate to the YMCA that they must bump? If you have minimum wage at 725 an hour at the federal level, I believe, and you bump to 950, then the lifeguards go up much more than a dollar. They go up two dollars and twenty-five cents. Because if if a person bussing tables has the same relative value as someone who's trained to save people's lives, administer CPR, and deal with emergency situations, those people are going to get a bump. The impact of the minimum wage is to continually bump up wages through the economy. That's a very real impact, and it's rarely calculated in, and so that's why small incremental steps are much more palatable to business because it gives them time to adjust their infrastructure. And taking a leap to 950 is probably going to be detrimental to a lot of those small businesses in Hackensack and in Greater Minnesota. I just it's 950 by 2015, and the minimum wage isn't something new that's we're, we're just freshly debating here. I mean, the minimum wage has been raised dozens of times since the 1950s, and there is a weight of evidence that su suggests that there is a negligible impact on jobs and a beneficiary impact on the lives of the people who are making the additional wages. Now, my numbers assume that there were two lifeguards per day, and I, we're sort of getting into it. But the, the bottom line is, is that not like every, word not every commodity, yeah, exactly. not, yeah, more lifeguards. Not, not every commodity, <laughs> right. not every uh, service relies on minimum wage employees. And so, you know, not everything. There's not a, a total inflationary impact of that because not everything relies on minimum wage services. And if I could just add, you know, I think this is an opportunity for us really to, to make a statement that in Minnesota work should pay. And uh, I, I respect your, your concerns with uh, how far we go and how fast we get there. But I think that the, the concern I've heard today, it really speaks to, uh, I think, a, an effort to maybe index the minimum wage and, yeah. and, 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 and provide some certainty for, for employers and for uh, laborers in, in Minnesota's economy that, that we're on a, a, a slow growth curve moving forward and that, uh, that if you're going to work hard in Minnesota, you're going to be able to, to raise a family and, and get by and not just get by. I couldn't agree more that we need to invest in education. We've got to make sure that we've got infrastructure for the 21st century and that we play off our strengths in human capital. But at the end of the day, we've got to make sure the folks are, who are working in particular are able to, to eke out a living in this, uh, this economy. And uh, darn it, you know, I, I don't think the fact that we've failed to raise the minimum wage in the past should keep us from doing what's right in 2014. Well, let's move on. We'll probably have a chance to talk about more about the minimum wage. Certainly, <laughs> certainly not, if, not in this program. We'll keep picking it up in future weeks. There's no right. doubt about it. Again. It'll probably come up again. So, so we have a question from a viewer who's paying attention to our Facebook page. Now, notwithstanding my earlier reference to facsimiles, I'd love to talk to you about quill and parchment because that's also an area that I'm an expert at. But, but we also have a Facebook page. It's all over your hands. So. Right. Yeah, that's right. It's that's the, true. the ink yeah. in the bottle. Yeah. But I do want to remind people that we do have a Facebook page, and we can be reached there as well. And our viewer from uh, our viewer on the Facebook page has a question about our pension uh, plans, and particularly state uh, pension plans. Wants to know if there's going to be any discussion about that. I think this viewer thinks that uh, the assumed rate of return is too high. Is concerned that uh, these plans are underfunded, and you know, what are we going to do about that problem? And so. Is there going to be discussion about pension plans in this short session? We had a, some discussion last year. What, what's the program? Anybody know? There, our pension plans are facing some challenges. Um, and in my opinion, the rate of return has been set too high. It was lowered, and it's going to be bumped up, um, I think, a little imprudently. Um, but they're talking about rolling, I believe it's the Duluth teacher's pension into a statewide pension. And so there will be an opportunity to have these discussions um, to look at whether or not <coughs> we're being realistic about our rates of return. Um, there was significant reform that started impacting in 2010 that did a significant catch up on pensions. But we're still at a gap. I, I want to say the gap 17 percent, but I, I wouldn't mm -hmm. be quoted on that number at this point. It's been a while since I've looked. Anybody else want to talk about that topic? If not, we'll if you move talk on. too much, you have to go to the Pensions <laughs> Commission. I'll talk with you. Yeah, sorry, I'm not running for the commission. Um, but I think uh, we should keep the promises we've made to people. Yeah. Yes. And especially um, this, the, once the state's in charge of some of the state employees, and some of the people who work at my treatment center in my district, I know they work mm -hmm. for pretty modest wages, and they're kind of counting on this, this um, modest pension, which seems like a lot to them, but we, which we need to protect. But this... Um, it's kind of arcane, this rate of return business, but the higher you presume the rate of return will be, the more fun of the pension seems. Oh, look, we're good. And so I think it's important to be realistic. But I, 
But I, I think it's important, again, to have a good dialogue where we appreciate the value of the employees that we've been paying in our state uh, and what they do, and then make sure that we make promises that are sensible, but are, that we will keep them. Yeah, you have and, to keep the promises yeah. you made. Viewer from Cottage Grove wants to talk about a topic that has been in the news, Mincher. Caller had difficulty signing up through the automated system and ended up with her son on medical assistance, which was not her intent, and having problems getting this fixed. Is anyone working on this? Who wants to talk about Mincher? I guess we'll pick on you, Senator Benson. We'll That's start fine. with you. That's just fine. Um, Mincher has not rolled out well, and it has been exceptionally expensive and painful for Minnesotans. It has not accomplished the goal of reducing the number of uninsured. It hasn't made care more affordable or more accessible. Our premiums in the state all went up. We have very high deductibles and really narrow networks, including pharmaceutical formularies and restrictions on what medical devices you can use uh, within your miniature networks. Um, and so structurally, not accomplishing its goals. People are working on it. We changed directors, and Commissioner Scott Lights, I believe, is a very sincere man. He's exceptionally hardworking. Um, but he is bringing in some outside e experts, and they'll, the selection will be made next Tuesday as to who new, the new oversight contractor will be. Now, we don't have a plan to pay for that, and Minsure is structurally in deficit starting in 2015. So there's a lot of work to be done. And as far as the consumer <laughs> side of things, um, they are starting to improve. Some of the customer experience call times are going down, but a lot of that's because the broker community has engaged and is assisting people getting through Minsure. Our counties are really struggling because once you put somebody into the medical assistance program, you literally can't change. If they move, you have to write down and contact the insurance company to get their insurance card sent to the correct address. If they have a baby and babies are automatically enrolled in uh, medical assistance, if mom's on medical assistance, you can't add the baby in the county system. So they have lists and lists and lists of changes that need to be made and they're having to call the Department of Human Services to get them enacted. It, it's just not been well done at all and uh, we've got a long way to go. Other thoughts? You know, it's hard to, to, uh, to defend the rollout, and uh, I don't think anyone was uh, prepared for the transition here initially. You know, I'd like to, uh, you know, apply a historical lens here. I think in the in 1960s, you know, I can't remember those days, but, you know, we had the, the rollout of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, Medicare and, and Social Security and, you know, controversial programs in their own right. But you look back now and what would we do without them? And, and so I think that it's important for us to have patience, but we also have to realize that a lot of Minnesotans have incredible anxiety over this right now. And we can't fix the technical uh, problems with Minsure fast enough. Uh, and, and also, we have to just make sure that, uh, that, that there will be choices and options for all Minnesotans. And I know in southeastern Minnesota, there's concern over lack of competition and, and lack of uh, insurance providers and carriers in the area. And, and so I, you know, I, I want Minsure to work, and I think that if any state can do this right, it's Minnesota. We've uh, we've had a false start here. I'm hopeful that we've learned our lessons, and we're gonna we're gonna you know, have a good uh, you know, second attempt at this. I have confidence, and I think uh, the direction that I, I see the you know the uh, the board going right now. But uh, yeah, it's hard to defend where we where we are now. And I think what I would ask my colleagues is to have an open mind and, and let's fix this. Let's make it work, and let's uh, let's set the example for the rest of the states in this country on how to how to, to, to apply the Affordable Care Act. Well, I, you know, recognize when I'm sitting across the table from the yeah. Board of Human Services Committees, and, and I'm on education committees, sure. so I won't, um, you know, get in too deep. Other than to say that, you know, I had a, a relative who had contacted me. He's a, a conservative, uh, and he and he said that, you know, hey, I You're got one this. of those families too. Where yeah, not yeah, yeah about, absolutely. Uh, that's how I got to be the way I am. Yeah. <laughs> so he he called me up, and he he said, you know, I got this letter, and they told me my premiums are going up 200 bucks a month, and you know, Obama this and Obama that, right? And uh, I said, well, I tell you what, I, I want to, you know, have an opportunity to, to go through the exchange. And I said, let me, you know, grab your material and I'll come over and I want to see how this works. And this was in the weeks, you know, leading up to New Year's Eve. Uh, there was no question that the website was difficult to operate. It was about the time that the governor had put the extension on enrollment mm -hmm. um, to try and deal with some of those things. Uh, the website, you know, had some very technical glitches. It uh, shut down, and I had to restart it. And I, I mean, it was it was it was very frustrating. But at the end of the day, um, you know, given his tax information, uh, he's a self-employed uh, contractor, and he's got one son. 
and given his tax information and his family status, uh, he qualified for a certain credit. And he's in that kind of income range where you're trying to get people, encourage, you know, encourage them to buy insurance because they were opting out of the market at one point. And so um, given the tax credit he qualified for, uh, we were able to easily compare the plans once we got to that point. Uh, you could see fact sheets that you know, compared uh, the plans against one another with the same information. It's very easy to read. And he got a plan that gave him uh, comparable coverage at about $150 less a month than he was paying initially. Yeah. And so um, you know, he had to kind of concede that the plan actually worked <laughs> for him despite all of its difficulties. It probably hasn't changed the rest of his opinion. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know that, but I do know he voted for me. So that's, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. There you go. Yeah. It's funny that you said at the end of the day, which is actually the average length of people having to bring lunch, have a cup of tea. Um, just to even step back again, as this thing, you remember this came out of Washington, divided government. They couldn't get Olympia Snow to vote for this thing. You know, really? I mean, she's a pretty liberal Republican, and I thought she would be the one they could capture. And so all comes 60 to nothing and, and greatly contested and uh, all one side and, and a belief in, it's like a religion, that this is the thing to do. And then it comes to Minnesota, uh, again divided. And at the end, 100% one side, zero on the other. And some people like us tried to offer advice. And we offered, the advice I offered, Senator Benson offered advice, it was actually bona fide advice. Mm -hmm. We said, how about if people on the board actually know insurance? How about if we like, three and a half percent is a lot of money to add to a cost? We think kicking out a plan that could be that qualifies with all the criteria you've set, this active purchaser, is something that you mm -hmm. should just not do and leave the rest of the market alone. This is all over an effort to get 9% of the people insured. Out of the 9% uninsured in Minnesota, 4 or 5% qualify for state programs if they would just go sign up at their county or the hospital or somewhere. 2 or 3% don't want insurance. They don't need it, they don't want it, they just don't. And then, so really to solve a 2 or 3% problem, we've turned the whole market on its head. And even more ironically, at the end of the day, everybody's gotten carved out except the individuals and, and the, the regular people. The big business got carved out. Big labor is going to get carved out, I'll predict. Just write that down. Um, <laughs> the big hospitals, big health care, big pharma, everybody big has been given waivers, exemptions. And even now the medium business has gotten exemption just by a fiat order. And so who's left but the regular people? And it didn't have to be this way. That's my frustration. And, and I talked before about the bonding bill and respect and and the zeal, and the zeal about the minimum wage. I mean, you want to do a good thing, but there's consequences to the good thing, and you have to do a balance and make sure that the good you want to do is not overwhelmed by the bad that may come from something that's unintended. On a good day, we listen to each other, and I'm still preaching that. So, right. yeah. Amen. I, thank you. You know, I, I uh, wanted to revisit some of the things Representative Abler said about it, the Affordable Care Act, and of course, I think it was passed in 2009, um, and it was a 60 to 0 vote. Um, a lot of people, um, you know, Democrats, I don't think were entirely enthusiastic about the prospect of it either because we had envisioned a much different plan, especially if we were going to pass it with 60 Democratic votes. I think that the president moved far, as far to the center as he possibly could have while holding on to his other side to try and get one single Republican vote. And we knew that this country has the problem of paying the highest rates per capita of any industrialized nation for health insurance in addition to the highest increases year after year. And we still have large percentages of the population uninsured. And so I guess the question is, you know, after 20 years of talking about health care at the national level or 30 years, you know, what was the solution? What was the alternative plan? And finally, we've seen one. And, you know, it, the Republicans, Warren Hatch, and a few of his uh, huh. other senators out there have, have rolled out a plan. But, I mean, what was the alternative? And then once it was turned over to the states after 2009, there was an entire legislative session where, uh, Representative Abler, you were, you know, very involved. And I guess the question in my mind is, you certainly would have had a lot more leverage to negotiate with the governor at that point in time over a, an exchange that was more to your liking, and why didn't that happen? Well, I firmly believe there's, an ex there's not an exchange we could have built that would have passed muster with Washington. Just paying attention to the rulemaking that has come down since this law is enacted is mind-boggling. You cannot keep up with it. And the rulemaking now that they're putting on a Minnesota care plan is actually bankrupting the plan. The problem isn't necessarily the partisanship. And the problem isn't necessarily how it was enacted here in Minnesota. The problem is Minnesota had good health care, and we had low rates of uninsured, and we had good bipartisan things happening here. Minnesota care was very bipartisan, respected, and shored up good working-class Minnesotan health care, and it is being destroyed 
because we turned it over to Washington instead of saying, no, Minnesota knows how to do this. We can do the right thing. We can work together, and we will take care of Minnesotans. And so the federal government forcing their model onto Minnesota instead of us having our own, we didn't need an exchange that was designed by Washington following Washington's rules. We could have kept our systems in place, stabilized our insurance marketplace, kept our costs where we could manage them, and reached out, as Representative Abler said, to those people who were on the margins of being in public programs and actually gotten people insured without spending $180 million, not for one doctor, not for one child getting immunizations, but on an IT system that doesn't work. But if I could just add, you know, I would just caution anybody to, to make any final judgments on this. Uh, obviously, the rollout of Minsure has, has not worked out. But uh, when you look at trying to make health insurance work and, 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 and spread the risk and, and get more Minnesotans access to health insurance and health care as a result, you know, this is the, this is the approach that, that we've taken. And uh, I think, you know, Minsure is a better alternative than healthcare.gov. Uh, it's going to be better for Minnesota. There's some kinks. There's some learning, you know, involved. Uh, you can't defend the problems that we've had. But what, what kind of lessons can we learn from that? And I, and I hope that, you know, I think the four of us sitting around this table, we could figure out some solutions to this. And, and I hope the legislature, you know, uh, broadly speaking, is open-minded enough to, to make this work. Uh, but I think when, when you're trying to extend access to, to all Minnesotans uh, through health insurance, you know, the, the key is how do you spur the risk and how do you get more Minnesotans, you know, to sign up for health insurance. And I think technology is going to serve us well. It, it's just uh, we've, we've got to give it a chance to work. And so I, you know, I, I'm optimistic, um, but uh, obviously it's, it's, it's been a tough start here. Well, maybe the thing is we just had too big of a too big of a hammer to, to kill the gnat that we were worrying about. And mm -hmm. um, I think that health care should be a state topic. And I think that Mississippi should copy Minnesota. We had, the, in fact, even in the exchange, we had the lowest rates. We already had the lowest rates, so that shouldn't be surprising. Um, we had coverage for, for the uh, uninsurable. We had MCHA. Mm -hmm. And we had a plan, we, and which had to be dissolved because the federal rules wouldn't allow it to pay for it. Here we had a functioning, really good system, and that's all. And so I, I think on the premise, the idea that some well-intended, good people, I'm not on question motives, uh, in Washington said, we're going to fix the country for this access issue. Mm -hmm. Didn't cover cost or quality yet. And so if, you're, if you had to build a federal plan, they should have taken Minnesota and stuck it on the whole country. Sure. Let's go take the great leading ideas from across and put those. And instead, it was lawyers and plumbers and candlestick makers <laughs> designing a system. Throwing things together. And here we are. And so I, I think, well, it's here. And so here we are. So I, I think your advice is probably prudent. Let's Can't turn back the clock now. Yeah. <laughs> a viewer from uh, Clearbrook and a viewer from Bruton want to talk about uh, budget surpluses. The viewer from Clearbrook says, why raise taxes when we've got a $1 billion surplus? And the viewer from Bruton says, um, what are the odds the 2014 legislature can resist the urge to spend all that money and instead put some of it away in a solid rainy day fund? All right, what are we going to do with the surplus? Who wants to take a run at that? <laughs> yeah. um, so let's assume, you know, for the sake of argument that the February forecast, which will be next week, assumes that there's about a $1.1 billion surplus. Um, right now, and who knows, it could be more, it could be less, but um, that's what we're working with based on the, the November numbers. Um, I think that you know, it's good to stock the rainy day fund, but we should keep in mind that the previous legislature, I think, faced, uh, faced about a $6 billion deficit. And so, I mean, you you could apply that rainy day fund in one fell swoop and have it wiped out, and then there you are. You know, so if you have uh, disaster, emergency things come up after that, you still have to consider it. Um, I, I think that there's going to be a solid discussion about uh, the business-to-business -business taxes. Um, I'm in particular favor of uh, examining the uh, farm service repair tax uh, and also the broadband uh, or the uh, telecommunications equipment yeah. tax, which impacts broadband development rural uh, places in Minnesota. Um, I think that, uh, you know, if I anticipate what my colleagues across the table might say, <laughs> it's that, uh, you know, you, you raise taxes too much and then you should give the money back to them. Well, I think that um, after in eight of the last ten years, we faced budget deficits, and we've responded in nearly every instance with cutting. Uh, that's what the axe on your shirt came from, as I remember, <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the health and human service budget. I mean, we cut billions of dollars, as you well know, and um, that's, that's adversely impacted uh, schools across Minnesota, local government across Minnesota. In that time, we've seen property taxes double, and so a cut isn't really a cut if you just ship the cost on to someone else. Uh, an example of that, you know, is in the K-12 budget, or in the uh, higher ed budget, where uh, students are now paying two-thirds of their tuition costs instead of a third just a generation ago. And so you can't just, I, I think, um, 
assume that from here on out we're going to run budget surplus. I think that we are going to, you know, deal with uh, some cycles like we've dealt with in the past, and I think that we should be careful in how much of the money we send back. I, and personally, you know, um, if there's going to be some back, I think that we should maybe target it towards a middle class tax cut and, uh, in effect, make the tax rates in Minnesota more progressive. Representative Abel, your thoughts? Um, none of the money in the budget is free. It didn't fall out of the sky. Uh, we also rely heavily on federal funding to support our budgets. And if you add up all of the budgets, the health budget that's supporting the Minnesota care change, it's going to be short by a billion four come 2021. And that's not baked into the numbers. So just to point out that, that there are some of this, this, uh, these challenges coming to us. Um, it's really tempting to take money that you have and buy things that you want. But it's important to remember that that goes into the base budget. And every year, that goes forward. And so uh, you have to generate more money. And if you carefully look at the budget items for the different topic areas, um, you have to be able to pay for what you decided. And the human service one of all has uh, exploded just lately with the expansion of the Medicaid program. And just so you know, in, in the, the cuts we did, we call them cuts, we reduced the growth by half. And so in a time of crisis, and we did such a good job that it didn't come up in the election, which is unheard of, <laughs> that you can make these changes cut a billion dollars a year and it doesn't get turned into a postcard. And so if you look at what you're spending carefully, you can get more mileage out of it. And in many cases, people got better services with less money being spent on a more modernized method, speaking of facsimiles and telegrams. <laughs> and so that's I'm what I'm speaking of facsimiles. Oh, else. sorry. <laughs> and that's what I think we need really to do. And even though there's a surplus, make sure everything you're buying is, is sensible, is at a good value. And it is something we would choose to buy if we were short of money. And then you can really put the money where you choose to go. If, it's, if we decide we want to have a lower tuition for people to go to college, which is an arguably very good goal to have more people to go, especially the minorities, so they can be all that they can be. Um, so, but prudence and restraint is hard sometimes if you're a legislator. <laughs> Senator sure. Benson? Um, I would be in favor, in fact, of repealing the farm equipment repair tax the telecom tax, but also the warehouse tax, which hasn't been enacted yet. And if we did an early tax bill, then those warehousing companies could get a little more certainty, a little more comfort. And the tax not, has been enacted, but it's not in effect yet. It is right. not in effect right. until April. Um, they, could, they could be certain of their business structure going forward. Um, you talked about property taxes. After the Republican budget was enacted, we saw the lowest average growth in levies in, in like 15 years, something like that. And the rates for this year haven't been certified yet, but it looks like four out of five cities had significant increases in their property taxes. We'll get those numbers at the end of May. So in spite of all the spend, the tax relief that you did for cities, LGA, property taxes are locally controlled. They make the decisions. The legislature has marginal impact on property taxes. So, um, but as far as the surplus, I think we need to repeal those business-to-business -business taxes. Federal conformity, so our marriage penalty, it, we're one of the few states that has a marriage penalty. The feds don't even have it. We're t one of two states that have a gift tax penalty. Um, we don't allow employer tuition to be deducted. It's counted as income. We don't allow adoption expenses to be deducted. It's counted as income. When an employer assists you with your adoption, Minnesota taxes it as income, even though the feds don't allow it. So there's a lot of really practical things we can do for Minnesota families with that money. You know, I'd, I'd propose that we be conservative with this surplus, that we show restraint, uh, that we get off that revenue roller coaster that's plagued Minnesota for the last decade and, and, uh, and think to the future. And I think that's why the 2013 legislative session was so important, because I believe it, it solved our budget problems for the foreseeable future. And if, if we make prudent choices moving forward, we're going to be able to talk about education reform, about investing in infrastructure like roads and bridges and, and, and telecom that I, I talked about earlier. And also, uh, I think what we need is a, you know, a, a, a comprehensive discussion of tax reform in Minnesota. Those are conversations that are very difficult to have when you're going budget deficit to budget deficit and making short-term decisions like we have for the last decade in Minnesota. So I'm really optimistic that this, the decisions we made in 2013 will open the door for meaningful conversations about those sorts of reforms. You know, if we, if we look at what we should do with the surplus, so I, I think federal tax conformity is, is certainly uh, something that we should focus on. And those business-to-business -business taxes, uh, clearly, you know, uh, we, 
we can do better things than, than uh, impose those. And I think uh, it, it's clear that, that that was a mistake of 2013. I think it's important for us to admit that, and I think that we can fix that early. But I think when you look at the impact of 2013 and, and 2014 moving forward, We've balanced our budget once and for all. We're able to think big about reforms moving forward and, and get past that, that, that partisanship and, and, uh, and that short-term budgeting that has really plagued us for the last decade. I, I don't think that we can overstate the importance of that session and what that's going to mean for us moving forward. And so hopefully we're able to, you know, to chart a, a slow growth curve in terms of our investments with uh, local government aid or, or funding education and have a more meaningful partnership between state and local government so that they can, they can ex expect, uh, you know, uh, they, they can predict you know, what the state's going to contribute in terms of AIDS and, and, uh, and uh, tax accordingly. And I think that, that revenue roller coaster that we were on, that's something we, we never want to replicate again. And I, I think prudent budgeting and, 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 and handling this surplus in a responsible way is going to set us up for, for success moving forward. Redemption, I, I, redemption? You know, uh, Senator Benson had uh, mentioned the marriage penalty, and I just wanted to point out that I've been working very hard to avoid the marriage penalty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but beyond that, you know, uh, uh, Representative Abler also mentioned, you know, that uh, they had cut uh, a significant amount of money out of the HA HS budget in the pre previous biennium and that uh, it went unnoticed. And I think that one of the reasons it went unnoticed was because the only thing that anybody talked about during the last election or, or one of the major things that was talked about during the last election was the fact that, uh, you know, billions of dollars were shifted away from our K-12 schools. And so it was an instance of using a gimmick to balance a budget. Uh, and when we came into this legislative session, um, well, I mean, you know, I mean, and I understand that uh, the schools will get their money back, but um, we, we, you know, in this year, we, we balanced the budget for two years and out into the, the tails for four years. And I think that uh, Senator Schmidt is totally right that you have to be on solid financial footing if you want to ha make the, the comprehensive and long-term decisions that you want to make about the direction that the state should be headed in. Senator Benson, 15 seconds on the um, school shift. The school shift was House File 1, and they didn't pay it back. So it was a good talking point for the election, but when it came down to it, and they shifted $400 million out of the Health Care Access Fund. And I'm sure that there are more there are responses to that, responses to that, responses to that. But, but we're out of time. We're out of time. Jim, Representative Abler is all wound up. Now, I want, to, I want to thank our panel tonight. It's been great. I want to thank you, the viewers, for joining us. I want to remind you that these issues and other issues are going to be with us each of the following weeks until the legislature goes home. We're delighted you're with us. We're looking forward to a great season. Thank you all for our inaugural show. And thank you, the viewers, and good night. Thank you. Thank you. That's just fun. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org. Find out more about the history of the program, who's been a guest, and watch all our past episodes. There's also a photo gallery, informative links, and much more. You can also get involved and stay in touch by following us on Twitter and join the discussion on our Facebook page. Thank you for watching Your Legislators. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of Meet members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans.